Wonderful Golf in Wales Stadium. How many people are here at SeaWorld for the very first time? Go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, good. We've got a lot of new friends with us. That's going to be a lot of fun because we'd like to share with you a unique SeaWorld experience. We brought together a group of unusual animals for the very first time. So we'd like you to join us. We begin to understand each and every one of them.
gentlemen, the host of Shawnee Stadium, Mr. Ron Baer. Thank you and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to Shamu Stadium. First, let me remind you that if you're sitting in the first six rows, you could get wet. <laughs> Shamu Stadium is one of the three largest man-made killer whale habitats in the world. And here in San Diego, as in Orlando, Florida, and San Antonio, Texas, SeaWorld has developed a state-of-the-art facility that is designed not only for display, but also to accommodate research, training, breeding, and above all, the health and safety of these fascinating animals. And all of this may now be viewed on our new elevated walkway, which surrounds the entire killer whale complex. As we begin our 25th year, we at SeaWorld take great pride in the role we have played in bringing killer whales to the public consciousness. Over 50 million people have shared a very special experience, an experience they might never have otherwise known. They have seen with their own eyes Shamu, the killer whale. And for us, this is a great responsibility because as you leave here today, you will carry with you a lasting impression of all killer whales. Are they smart? Are they dangerous? There are many open questions, and we ask that you form your own opinion. But one thing that Shamu has taught us, these animals deserve our respect. In everything we do here today, we have in mind the safety of both trainer and animal. Over the past 20 years or so, something very unusual has happened. The name of a whale has become very familiar in households all across America, in fact, all around the world. He has been visited by kings and statesmen, by hundreds of celebrities, but most importantly, by millions of children who have grown up with a sense of understanding instead of fear or distress. And now, here to help us celebrate our silver anniversary along with trainer Mike Scarpuzzi, ladies and gentlemen, Shamu! Hi there, Shamu. Everybody's all excited about our 25th year anniversary show. Are you ready to go? Hey, I got an idea, Ron. Let's get things started off and let everybody get a good look at Shamu. Okay, Mike, and while we do that, let's take a look at some of the special physical characteristics that make him unique. The most obvious, of course, is his size. He is huge. Up to 30 feet long, killer whales can weigh as much as 18,000 pounds. And you can't help but notice the striking black and white coloration. Now, this disruptive pattern he wears disguises his actual shape. Perhaps confusing some would be prey. But right now, let me ask a question of all the kids here in the audience today. How many of you think that Shamu is a big fish? And how many of you think that Shamu is a mammal? Oh, smart. You're right. Shamu, like all whales and dolphins, is an air-breathing mammal who is adapted to a watery environment. That's right. Right now, Shamu's giving everyone a great big wave. Now, Shamu is waving at you with his pectoral flipper. While this flipper appears featureless, if you can look at an x-ray, you see elements of the forelimbs of land mammals. And a bone structure not unlike that of a human hand. And all of these creatures and adaptations do more than ensure his survival in a harsh environment. In fact, they combine to make him the top predator of the sea. There is no disputing that he has earned the name Killer. His teeth 
are 44 in number, conically shaped, interlocking, designed for ripping and tearing. But the most important element in his success as a hunter is his unequal ability to swim. A layer of rubber and buoyancy and streamlines his body. His pectoral flippers provide maneuverability. The dorsal fin acts as a stabilizer. But the essence of his swimming ability is his powerful tail. The large, flattened flutes moving up and down give him tremendous propulsion. All right, Camo, let's put it in gear. Watch closely. Killer whales can reach speeds up to 30 miles an hour in the open ocean. Yeah, but not everybody gets to see killer whales swim in the open ocean. But right now, Shamu and Corky are really turning on the speed. But in fact, he is not confined to just the water. No matter how many times we see this, it still almost defies the imagination that a creature has the power to propel as much as seven tons of muscle and bone completely up and out of the water. Here. I need one too. 
Okay, why don't you come right up here and peek? Of course, you can see right through the glass. What I need you to do, stand right in front of her. You can put your right hand out to your side. And I'm going to slap in the air. And of course, you'll do a similar thing using her petrol flipper. <laughs> All right, now it's Orkie's turn. Now, why don't you turn in a circle? That's good. And we'll see if we can get Orkie to do the same kind of thing. Now, I'm going to help Orkie out with the hand signal at the same time. Can you figure this out, Orkie? Can you do this thing, guys? Boy, this is a challenge for Orkie because this is something he has not seen very much before. And he's looking at us real hard. Look at Orkie. He's studying you and he's looking at me. And he says, what is it you guys want me to do? <laughs> Now you step right over here. And now, uh, just a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Orky started. And then you're gonna turn into a position. Oh, Orky, that's not quite it. Orky's rolling over, but he's not, he doesn't have quite the idea. Now, what happened that time was very interesting. Because Orky saw, you do that, and then he tired and started to roll upside down. And just that happened, he heard Curtis. So if you see it right down there, he heard Curtis roll his whistle, and he understood that to mean that he was doing correctly. You turn in a circle now. Oh, did you hear him go to whistle? Yeah, that's what happened. That's okay. Now, Orky, now he's got the right idea. And a boy. Thank you for your help. Well, John, how about another hand signal? Good plan. I'm going to move over here and see if I can get some more victim, uh, volunteers. Any grown-ups? Okay. Up oh, here. Okay, uh, right there. In the green. Make your way down. And go right outside here. Okay, Curtis, go ahead. <laughs> He's big, isn't he? You're gonna put, well, your palms you like put your hands out in front of you, palms up. And when I count to three, throw your hands straight up over your head. You ready, John? Ready. Okay, one, two, three.
Curtis, can any of those sounds be heard beneath the surface of the water as well? Let's find out. We're going to turn on our hydrophone so we can listen underwater. <laughs> That's fascinating. You know, we know that killer whales can produce a wide range of sounds, and while we don't necessarily know exactly what they mean, we realize that Corky and Shamu and the rest have the ability to distinguish different sounds. In fact, for years, the trainers have been using high-pitched whistles to let the animals know when they perform correctly. But you know, not only are we training and communicating through the use of sight and sound, but also through the use of touch. But Curtis, how do you go about actually touching a killer whale? The answer to that is very carefully. Over the years, it's been a slow, step-by-step -step process, and we found that the whales have very sensitive skin. In fact, we even train him to respond to some physical signals. For instance, if I wanted Corky to roll over, all I had to do is place the palm of my hand right to the end of a rostrum. Good, Corky. Obviously, in trying to communicate with Corky, there's a great barrier. She is a creature of the ocean. We are of the land. She cannot enter our world. However, we can enter hers, at least for a while. Right now, Curtis is preparing to spend a few minutes in the water with Corky, and he does so with the utmost care and concentration, using everything he has learned in training, sight, sound, and touch, to stay in control as he asks Corky to perform with him. Let's watch Curtis and Corky. We just might learn something ourselves.
hip pressure is probably more hips than the feet. Those little ones only weigh about three to four hundred pounds. So this is an East African river hippo. It's weighing in somewhere between three and five thousand pounds. So I think now that they're underwater, they can hold their breath for about eight minutes before they have to come out for air. And they do not swim. What they do when you think they're swimming is they're actually walking along the ground underneath the water. Oh, these down for the river hippo. Three miles per hour. Those female emus lay an egg that looks just like a gigantic avocado. They leave that egg for the male. He comes along, he hatches it, he raises it for the first year and a half, while she's off finding her mate for the next season. These are called Patagonian cavies. They are in the rose family. These are actually called relatives to the guinea pig. The larger deer that you see in here against the side wall, and one of them up in the front corner, are Pampas deer, found in Argentina. They're very rare. They're also extremely hard to find with those markings on their coat, because they live in the dense brush of the African rainforest. of the 
in that area on the left. We should have a couple of Verbose eagles in there. These are the only two outside of Africa. Those Verbose eagles and many other if you look right on this tree stump, down at this far end, there's a little teeny tan animal sitting straight up on there. He's called a meerkat, relative to the monkey. So whenever you see meerkats, you'll always see at least one of them sit up like that. What they're doing is that they're watching out for predators. A lot of their predators are birds of prey. That's why they have those little brown markings around their eyes. It helps to cut down the glare when they're looking up towards the sun. The second animal in here, if you look just behind that meerkat up on the top level, is a teeny little antelope standing right next to the palm trees. Smallest in the antelope family, called lesser kirk stick dick. The third animal in here is our Ripley's Believe It or Not creature. No. Right. How about the elephant? Oh, yeah. Those rock hyrax are the closest living relatives to the elephant. They have the same bone and dental structure. That little rock hyrax has keen on Only the males grow antlers. We have a male in here somewhere. He likes to hug down in the boat in the early morning. In fact, if you look backwards a little bit, you can see his antlers sticking up over the top. The animals that have antlers shed their antlers and grow a new set about once every year. Unlike the animals that have horns. So if an animal that has horns were to break or lose a horn for any reason, it could never grow another side back. So only deer have antlers, and all of the antelope have horns. On the left is our African plains exhibit. The small pan animals with a brown track on their side are called Thompson's gazelle. The top are called per hour. Their legs are so strong that they're actually capable of killing lions, but they say they will kill. The big gray animals that you see mammals, these are called Ringo or Rothschild giraffe. This first one, or darker of the two, is the male. His name is Topper. He's got 18 feet tall. Next to Topper is a female named Checker. She's about 16 feet tall. On the back of that long neck that giraffes have, they only have seven vertebrae, like you and I do. They also have the highest blood pressure of all animals. Probably because it does take an awful lot of pressure to get blood up that long neck to their brain. But they do have an excellent pump for that. The giraffe cart is two feet long, weighs about 24 pounds, and pumps about 20 gallons per minute. Giraffes have 17 inch long tongues. Now they normally use them to pluck the leaves off the thorny branches. Joey likes to use his for a toy. You can also catch him on occasion cleaning his eyes and ears with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking at your closer, you might be wondering why they don't walk out of here since we don't have any tall fences around them. That is because giraffes won't step more than a foot up or down. Everyone has different beliefs why that is. Some say it's because they're so tall that their depth perception is off. Others say it may have something to do with when they're born. If the mother gives birth to them while standing up, which means a six-foot drop right onto their head. It does snap the umbilical, and the smaller ones are Dorcas gazelle. <laughs> If you look on the cement level up here, she's laying right in a little cave. They're called Bisa Oryx. Over on the left side are some Demara Zebra. You really notice that they're a different color than the Grevy, so the black and white zebra. They also have a little bit different markings. So their stripes go all the way around them and underneath their stomach. And if you look just around their rear, you'll notice an intermediate beige stripe, making them have three colors all together. The zebra have never become domesticated. That's not only because of their ornery temperament, but it's also because they don't have a strong back. 
like our domestic horses do. Next door to the zebra are the only true buffalo. They're called forest buffalo. They're extremely aggressive animals found in the forests of Africa. On the left side are some Angolan roan antelope. Coming up on the right are the animals that are believed to be responsible for the myth of the unicorn. On the right side, they're called Arabian oryx. So if you get a good profile shot at these animals, you'll see how people might have believed that about the unicorn. But sometimes if you get a good look at them from the side, it does look like they only have a single horn coming out of the front of their head. <laughs> called Saiga antelope, they found in Russia. Bonnie, give everyone a little wave. Huh? Hi, Bonnie. Bonnie, don't you feel like waving this morning? Huh? Okay. Good morning. Oh. Okay, 
cute. But here's the thing we don't chill the water for our polar bears. Because they don't carry as much fat here as they normally do in the wild. In the wild, they feed on seals and things with a very heavy fat content. They don't believe that to be very healthy for them, especially for their heart. But since we have access to many other foods, we don't feed them so much fat, they don't carry so much fat on their body, and we don't have to chill the water for them. Once the big boy gets out of the pool today, they'll be able to notice an incredible size difference between those male and female polar bears.
They do that dusting because elephants actually have very sensitive skin. Now that helps them to avoid sunburn, and also helps to keep some of the insects from biting them. The African elephant looks like she's around in the back side of the barn, so we're going to look like it over to the other side. So we're on the right real quick, but they love only your mouth and papers. They're low on the nose that they have a prehensile. My nose. These animals have been illegally hunted, almost to the point of extinction. Because they're hunted only for that horn that's on the front of their face. People thought that necessary to use for dagger handles. They also thought it to be an aphrodisiac, where in fact it's made of keratin, which is the same as our almost like they're wearing a coat of armor. Two months old. Oh, Chinese wolf. Well, this sounds about conclude our tour today. Um, well, where are you going to be then? Because you go over there and you walk all around and you come back again.